Welcome to the Prep Athletics Podcast. This is Corey Heights. Some battles. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if they got us. If they did, maybe, maybe. So you will get better as a player during that year. So it was kind of exciting. Like, oh, yes, yeah, somebody wants me. Okay, welcome, welcome, welcome to the AAU Roundtable tonight here um, on Zoom. Uh, appreciate y'all joining in. And um, my name is Corey Heights. I'm the founder of Prep Athletics, and I put this together uh, to help answer questions on, you know, the basics of AAU, because uh, a lot of people in the basketball world get questions all the time about it. And I figured this was a good form to get three experts uh, in one place that can help us kind of figure out uh, the best way to move forward with it. So um, we're going to start with introductions real quick. My name is Corey Heights. I'm the founder of Prep Athletics and the Prep Athletics Basketball Podcast. Um, I'm a prep school consultant that helps kids pick the right fitting prep school. And I've been doing that since 2008. And uh, I did prep school myself. My cousin who played in the NBA did a uh, prep school year and it's changed my family's life and I'm trying to help others change their lives as well. So um, that is me and joining me on the panel tonight. Uh, first, I want to introduce coach Dave Taylor. Uh, Dave Taylor is a former D1 player and D1 assistant coach who's currently the head coach and president of the DTX AAU team based out of Connecticut. Uh, coach Taylor's run events all over the world and has coached NBA players to include James Harden, Kyrie Irving, Clay Thompson, and dozens more. And he's also, also the author of a book entitled AAU Wasteland. So he has actually uh, written a book on that that's available on Amazon right now. So Dave, welcome to the round table. Thank you for having me. And I don't want anybody getting confused. And you're I, muted, I so you need to unmute at some point. All oh. right. Okay. Well... Yeah. All right. Still can't hear you, but we got time to get back to you. Okay. Um, all right. Next up is Tom Bauer. Tom Bauer is the founder, co-founder of the Kentucky Basketball Commission. Uh, he has over a decade experience running travel basketball events to include bringing an EYBL event to Lexington, Kentucky. And he also runs a consulting company for pro athletes. So, Tom, welcome to the roundtable. Yeah, thanks for having me. Okay. I can't hear you either, which is we'll have to figure out. Uh, and next up is Travis Branham, who is a national basketball analyst for 24-7 Sports. He spent four years as an assistant to national scout Evan Daniels. So, Travis, welcome. Um, I wanted to bring these three guys on board because we all know each other in one way or another. And Dave Taylor actually was my coach at the Air Force Academy 25 years ago. Uh, he helps prep athletics bring players in that can uh, go to prep school. And he actually um, goes with me to Thailand, Taiwan when we go there to run camp. So we're connected a long time ago. He's one of the best coaches I've ever been around. And I think he does it the right way. Tom and I actually coached together uh, back over a decade ago at Lexington Christian Academy in Lexington, Kentucky. And we've been friends all this time because we kind of believe in the same coaching methods. And ironically, one of our players when we were coaching together was Travis Branham who is now uh, an industry expert in the high school recruiting scene. So we're going to start off with our first question here. Um, Tom and Dave, it's going to go to you first. Dave, how do you choose the right AAU team? Well, you know, that, that goes down to, uh, you know, your personal preference as far as style of play. You got to find a coach that fits your style of play. You're going to have to find a program that, uh, that, is suitable to your skill sets. And a lot of times you, you know, kids want to go to the best teams that win the most. That's not going to get you where you want to go. Sometimes you need to go to a program that is going to push you, challenge you, develop you. And still you need to make sure that they attend all the high level events where you're going to be seen and, and college coaches are going to be attending. So uh, it's a loaded question in the. fits your style of play uh, a program that's going to push you has a good reputation has a, a you know a track record of getting players to the next level that has the respect of college coaches because there's a lot of good programs out there that win games that college coaches look down upon I know when I was a college coach that I wouldn't want to recruit players at certain programs because they just didn't embody me they didn't have the embodiment of the program of the kind of kid I wanted so um, again I just think it, it comes down to, to style and the coaching style and and making sure that it's a good fit for you individually. Tom, how about you? Yeah, so 
the advice that I typically give people is, you know, to go where, first of all, it, it, like Dave is saying, he, he really nailed it. it it's got to be a fit um, in regards to, are you going to be able to play, um, first of all? Because that's mainly what AAU is, a, is about. It's having opportunities to get out there to actually play. Um, so you do want to be able to play or have an opportunity to play. It doesn't mean you have to start. It doesn't mean you have to be the best player on the team everywhere you go. But just to have an actual opportunity to improve and get better, AAU is more um, obviously – bent towards showcasing your skills to scouts and to college coaches. And so if you're really not going to have that opportunity, then it, there's not much of a point. Um, so, um, and then something that Dave brought up where it's not a fit for everybody. If you're a borderline college player, um, then you should get on a team that's going to play in the type of events of schools that, that where schools that will actually recruit you that you can play at will be at those events and they can see you. Um, that's crucial. Looking at a schedule um, that a coach would put together. Um, <clears throat> my standpoint, Corey, we've talked about this, is that I, for me, I'm in this for all kids. Most people just think like D1 or high level basketball or whatnot, but I get just as excited for the kid that gets the opportunity to play D3 um, or any level of basketball. And so being realistic with where you stand um, uh, as far as your skill level and your college opportunities. Um, should have an influence on the AAU team that you select because you need to be playing in front of the coaches and scouts that can actually help you get to this to the level of which you can actually play. And um, you know, a, a, another crucial part is organization um, in regards to is the AAU program do they have a, a reputation for being organized? Do you actually go to the events that that are on the schedule, or are there reasons why not? We see all types of things where kids jump on AAU teams and. They have this amazing looking schedule, but the reality is the, the coach can't handle the budget. And so by the time the middle of May rolls around, there's no more money to go to any tournaments when it was supposed to be budgeted all the way through July. And so, you know, there's, there's a lot of different things um, that we could go in on this, but really finding a fit with the skill level that you are, I think is, is crucial. And then getting with coaches that are um, organized and can actually follow through on, you know, a schedule and, and are organized are the two that I would hit. Yeah, but if I'm a parent and I've got five coaches coming after me, um, how do I know these things? Do you suggest talking to former players or current players? I mean, how, how do you figure out if they're going to the right tournaments if I don't know much about basketball? Or how do I know if they're going to have money at the end of the season? Well, track record is, track record is big. There are AAU programs that pop up, you know, every year. Uh, but typically people know that those are pop-up first year programs and you're kind of taking a chance by playing with them because they have no track record. But a lot of AAU programs, you know, they, they've been around for a while. And so talking with that coach and asking, you know, how many players have gone on to play college from your program? What level um, do they typically go to? There's different programs um, that I'm familiar with where, you know, pretty much all of their players go to play D2 or D3 basketball. And that's really the point of their program. They're not going after the elite of the elite prospects because they know what they're, where they're, they have the great contacts and relationships with the D2 and D3 coaches. Those are the players they try to recruit. So my recommendation is to talk with the coach and ask the coach these questions. What is your history in regards to putting players in college? Um, I'm about to turn over, you know, $1,000 to you. Um, I just want to ask before I cut this check, you know, in the past, have you all been able to finish the season? Because I've heard that AAU coaches sometimes, you know, just aren't the best with money and just asking these questions point blank. And if there's any hesitancy from the coach or if they get defensive or whatnot, I can go ahead and tell you, go ahead and just mark them off your list um, because a great AAU program would have those answers. And I think, I think a lot of times, uh, you know, you, you do want to ask these coaches these questions, but don't take their word for it because a lot of these coaches will say things that, Hey, I sent this guy D1. I sent that guy D3. I, and then you ask him for the names and, oh, I'll get that to you. You know, but I mean, um, I, I would never take the word of, a, of, of, you know, you have reputable programs. That's different. You know, if I go to a, a coach Bauer, that's a reputable program. But if you're going to, if you don't know anybody, um, you don't, don't take their word for it. Cause they're looking to most, a lot of these programs are just looking to get you in and get your money in. And, and try to get their program built, but they'll just feed you like, you know, use car salesmen, try to feed you uh, a line that's going to get you uh, excited to play for them. Uh, you really have to do your homework. It's not hard to do. You know, if they had former players, look them up, talk to them, you know, Hey, you sent this kid there. Let me talk to him. See what, see what kind of coach you were, see what kind of go to a game, watch him coach, go to a, you know, hopefully you'll do your due diligence the year before you decide to do all this and, 
kind of go out and just watch different programs play and, and see how they coach. But um, be very careful and always, you know, buyer beware. But you have to do your due diligence. You have to make sure that you just don't take their word for it. Um, Cause a lot of times I've, I know a lot of AU programs that will just feed you a bunch of lines, like personal trainers. They'll just say, I train Kobe, you know, Oh really? Cause you took a picture with them at a Laker game. Doesn't mean you train Kobe. So um, you just have to be careful of, of that. Like, you know, like just kind of what, what any coach would say. Um, and like I was trying to say before with Corey, you know, he made that introduction about me. I want to make this clear. I was not Kyrie's coach. I was not James Harden's coach. I did not, I'm not responsible for them being as good as they are. I was just working events where they were on uh, in the, in the camp and working programs with me. So uh, I want to make sure that's clear. I don't want anybody getting confused. I was, I was Kyrie's personal coach and uh, he's, I'm the reason he's there. So I just want to get that out there too. Don't you have a Mentally picture? Verify. With him? <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, that's good. Next question is for you, Dave. And mind you, everyone that's on right now, if you guys have specific questions, go ahead and chat them or type them up in the chat box. And uh, if we got time, we'll get to them. And um, so feel free. This is uh, this is pretty organic conversation here. Dave, I'm going to go back to you with AAU. I know a lot of kids will just go to events and play in uh, a weekend event. And that's it. And some teams actually practice. Does AAU practice even matter? Oh, well, of course it does. And I, and I could tell you stories that would take too long for this podcast. But um, there's a lot of guys out there that recruit players and say, play for me next weekend. And they show up in a different color uniform and, and uh, the kids don't know his name. They call him by number. Hey, 19, come over here. You know, and um, you know, you get a lot of those kind of situations where these guys are really bad for, for basketball. And, and it's, it's more common than you think at the higher levels. It's not really something you would see in a reputable program that's, that's working with kids of all ages and all skill sets, but uh, practice is extremely important. You know, we pride ourselves in our program of development. You know, we have a 17U national team where everybody's going to play after high school. Um, but I had them when they were 12 and 13. So I don't recruit. I have never recruited a player in my, in my entire lifetime as an AAU coach. I don't go to local high schools and look for kids. I want the kids to come to me, and then it's my job to develop them. So uh, what we do at our practices is all of our practices are live streamed. So we'll send the emails out to college coaches or text messages if you want to watch a kid, watch them at practice, because – as a coach, you want to see how a kid practices, but I want to see how he practices. Does he take coaching well? Does he work well with the team? Does he, does he catch the new system quickly or does it take him 10 or 12 practices to figure it out? Um, practices, if I'm going to sell a player, I, I need to have him at practice. I need to know what kind of practice player he is. I need to know how quick he can retain information. Um, so, yeah, I mean, anybody that would tell you it's not important is just somebody looking to get a quick win and try to build their program with a, with a trophy. But um, any real coach would tell you that you, you have to practice. We practice three, four times a week, um, and they're all very competitive and intense. But, uh, you know, that's what I want to challenge them with. And they get to know me, too. So uh, for me, it's invaluable. There's no way I could run a program uh, with players coming in that I've never coached. Yeah. And you actually do film session, too, with your kids, right? I do film. I send uh, – I have about 25 teams in my program. So I'll do 20 films a week, you know, where I have to go on and do a film and send it to every team, every kid, every parent. And it does more good than, you know, because the parent that thinks his kid should play more will watch the film and realize he shouldn't. So, um, but then we send film to college coaches, you know, we make all of our players have a website. Um, anybody who wants to get recruited, they have to do it a certain way. I don't take kids that are hovering at a 2.0. Uh, I don't care how good you are. And uh, you know, we do things the right way, but, uh, we have people on the back of the, you know, that they really do a lot of that hard work. Like Coach Roman does a lot of that stuff for us where he gets the names out. I can't do it all by myself. So we have a great program that that kind of fills every gap. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, Travis, this question is for you. Um, since you are ranking kids and uh, trying to figure out what level these guys are at, uh, you know, to keep the uh, recruiting service going and everything, does a player have to play AAU if they want to go to college? Um, they do not have to play AU. Um, however, I do believe that AU gives you the best opportunity of, um, exposure and, and gives you the best platform to get to that level. Um, there are a select few kids that do not play AU. Um, and they take the summers to rather train than play AU. And, um, for the kids that do that, that I know about personally, I mean, you're talking about a top 75 player. Um, that's well known already. Uh, they're got, I mean, they have all the physical tools you can possibly imagine. Unlike somebody like me back in high school, 
Um, so guys like that, they can get away with it. Um, but my, my advice in those circumstances would definitely be to play. You, you're going to be in front of the most coaches. Um, you're going to be playing the most games and you're going to give yourself the best opportunity um, to, to catch the eye of whether it's somebody like me or it's somebody like Dave um, that's, that's been, um, that is a coach and, and has been through it and they have the proper context to kind of pass your name along to the right people. So Travis, Tom, and Dave, yes or no, is AAU more important than high school ball? Or does it depend? Yes. yes. Okay. Tom? Oh, it, 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 it's in my opinion, it, it, it depends. It depends because, again, for, from my point of view, you know, I'm happy when, when young people are busy uh, doing something. And that doesn't mean that necessarily they're going to college to play a sport. But, um, you know, a, a lot of the kids that I'll deal with and be around, they, they might be from high-risk homes or whatever it might be. And if they weren't playing basketball, then they would, uh, you know, maybe be getting some other sort of nonsense or whatnot. So, um, to me, it, I, I'm just happy when they're busy. When kids are busy, they got something to look forward to, and they're working on something to try to get better at their life. They're learning discipline. They're learning wins and losses and how to, how to do both of them gracefully um, and all the life lessons that come from basketball. And so um, I, I can't necessarily say that one's more important than the other. If we're talking college specific, um, something that Travis mentioned um, earlier where it's easier for somebody like him to go see, it's hard uh, for, some, for Travis to get to uh, rural uh, Kentucky, you know, three hours away through the mountains and all this to watch one high school game against uh, players that, you know, most of them are not going to play college basketball. So it's hard for him to gauge if they're even good uh, or not. And so um, in these AAU events, he can see a mass amount of teams in one weekend playing against, you know, they're kind of quote all-star teams to a sense. And he can, he, he could uh, have a better gauge of the competition level. Um, and certain events you go to, you are playing, you have the opportunities to play against the highest ranked players and uh, get that film. And so when it comes to college scholarships, um, I don't think an argument can be made. AAU is more important when it comes to college scholarships. But on your day-to-day -day development, learning discipline, learning team, you know, a lot of that comes from uh, high school. And uh, the high school coaches, they are practicing six days a week most of the time. And it's really a fundamental process. A lot of programs start with fundamentals in sixth grade that they carry all the way through to senior year, and it builds on it. So high school has a vast importance. But um, – Again, if the ultimate goal is college scholarship, it's the AAU route. And I think it, it is a difficult question because um, it always depends. You know, it always depends on who the high school coach is and what league they're in and, and you know, what reputation they have. But they he hit it right on the head. I mean, it, everything is, is relative. But, you know, where I come from, you know, high school basketball isn't – it's not a hotbed out here in Connecticut. So, you know, you don't, you know, you don't see players on a regular basis that are – you know, college qualified. So putting stats together at the high school level does nothing for you really because the coaches know. I knew when I was a division one coach, if I got film of a kid and I saw him playing against somebody that wasn't even good enough to be on the JV, but for some reason he's on the varsity, I'm not going to respect that game film. So, you know, all-star games are where AAU goes. No, there's not to say that there's not good high school coaches out there. I've coached high school for 12 years in California. So, you know, there's good high school coaches, but again, you don't control the competition. You don't control the league. Um, you don't get, like you said, the mass amount of college coaches going to a gym. Uh, you might get some scouts, but you're not going to get a lot of college, college coaches going to watch a high school game. Not a lot because you only have a certain amount of days and you're not going to go waste one of them. And some, you know, like you said, it takes you 27 hours to get there. And then the kid gets 3000 the first quarter and he doesn't play. So, um, you know, AAU is, is really important because you have more games in a, you know, in, in a, in a smaller time frame, and you play against all-star teams. Um, you know, and, and it's really an environment that is conducive to the to the player that wants to get a scholarship. You know, so I agree completely with what everyone has said here that it, it's sad to say, but it is true that and to me, AU matters more than the high school season. Yeah. And Dave, I want to segue into that. Oh, go ahead, Travis. I was just going to kind of piggyback. Uh, they're, they're absolutely right. Um, it does depend a lot. But at the same time, if you're trying to uh, go to that collegiate route, um, it's way, just me speaking, it's way easier for me to go see, um, those kids in a U setting. You're seeing the overall efficiency for me to go, um, watch a kid at, at an AU event is way easier than it is to, like Tom said, go, go drive to rural Kentucky where you're watching kids, uh, play basically a bunch of former me's out there 
where they're uh, not very good and um, it's really tough to gauge the level of talent. So um, definitely when it, uh, it just kind of um, goes back to depending, but AU when it comes to that college, it's very important to me. Yeah, but Travis, do those kids have the heart you had? That's that's what I want to know. Probably not. <laughs> Probably not. Or the, or the wit. Not. Yeah. Well, uh, Dave, that's my next. Well, actually, let's, let's touch base on this question that came into the chat, which I think is a great one. Um, and this can be any of you guys. Is there an optimal age to start playing AAU? And when does it really matter when a player is looking for a scholarship? So what's the starting age? And when do players need to start putting it on for college coaches? Well, I know that, um, you know, we have a program from 10 years old all the way up. And it's, and again, everything is relative. So I want that to be said. But, um, you know, I think the sooner the better. And you just got to make sure you have the right coaches because, you know, we have a 10U program and you have to work on, you know, ball handling and passing and not shooting threes and not, you know, trying to press all the time and run up and down the court and just turn it into a recess setting. You just want to work on the fundamentals. You want to get better every day. I don't, I personally, I don't think it's ever too young, depending on how you play. Now, if I go to a tournament and all they're going to do is press and trap and run up and down and it's not worth my time, I'll go to a different tournament. Um, but I always tell parents whenever the kid wants to play and he's able to play and he's able to, to handle winning, losing and all those things and all those factors and hard work and he's got a passion for it, um, you know, that that's you, you can play. I have kids that are eight years old playing that are very, very good as eight year olds. So. Um, but we're not trying to win championships with them. We're just trying to teach them how to play the right way. That means you might lose games, but we don't play zone. You know, you're going to have to play man-to-man. You're going to have to, you know, learn the basic principles. And for me, I think I think when you turn 15, um, you know, this isn't for everybody, but when you turn 15, you have to have some kind of uh, sense of, of skill sets that, that are going to turn a coach on, you know, whether that be defensive or rebounding or, you know, just team-oriented stuff or just a freakish athlete. But uh, I'm looking for fundamentals in kids. And I know that when I was coaching at the Air Force Academy, you know, we didn't go out and actively recruit 15 year olds and 16 year olds, but they would be on a radar, you know, and you kind of know them as a rising junior, you know who they are, rising sophomores, you'll keep an eye on them. So uh, I think for me, when I used to work these events and go, go to tournaments and, and recruit other kids, I would be keeping an eye on, you know, guys that were rising sophomores just to see if I can get in early on them and, and really see if they're going to develop and continue to develop. So uh, it's always relative, but for me, I'll, I'll take anybody that has the passion for it. Yeah, I would, uh, you know, in, in hosting these events, we go age groups as, as low as second grade. Um, randomly, sometimes we'll have a group of first grade teams to come and play. Um, but I, I'm with coach that, that it's, uh, there's no time that's too early, um, but I think that it's all in the proper context. Um, but a lot of the um, nightmare stories that you hear are from, uh, you know, from, from parents of young kids that think that they're vying for scholarships at a, at a young, young age. And uh, that's, it's just not the case. Um, and as far as my experience on when it really matters, when a player is looking for a scholarship that really by your sophomore year is when they're going to start looking at you potentially as a, as a uh, recruit uh, most of the time, unless you're one of the special LeBron James, Marvin Bagley's that just burst on the scene at a, uh, extremely young age but uh you know it's just so rare for most players in my experience college coaches aren't really paying attention to your sophomore year even if you're big you know uh have a great freshman year gotcha now let's go back to dave here you actually wrote a book called aau wasteland you obviously had to have a lot of stuff built up for you to sit down and write it, this book so what what was your motivation to do it and why'd you write it well, I was asked to write it, you know, and it, it, people came to me and um, I was fortunate enough to have some people in my, in my camp that were very supportive of that. But I think, you know, I didn't just coach AU and I, I ran the national tournaments. I ran with the, with the pumps. I used to run their, you know, uh, West Coast all-star camps. I used to run their tournaments, all the NCAA certified events. So I really got to see it from both sides of the fence. And uh, there's a lot of bad out there. There's a lot of, um, you know, a lot of, just it, what everyone says is true. You know, there's, and it's not everybody. It's, it's usually the high end programs and even it's not all of them, but uh, the things I saw would, 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 you know, would just turn your head. It's just, it's just shocking what you would see. And, and you see a lot of these kids being used. Um, these kids are just being, you know, uh, treated like pieces of meat where they just try and, you know, pay them off and come to play for me and I'll give you what you want. And, 
And, uh, you know, I see a kid playing on three different, pro, three different teams and in, in three different weekends. So uh, I just thought that, that there is a wasteland out there where kids are kind of lost and um, they're not thought of in, in a way they should be thought of, which is, which is part of a family and, and developing and caring about them. It's really just about, you know, trying to win and get that shoe contract or get some kind of, you know, financial benefit from it, whether you can piggyback off their successes and try to get a college job or, uh, you know, just trying to win to get money from the shoe companies or whatever it takes. And I thought that, you know, a lot of that stuff was bad. And there's a lot of stories I even bring up in the book that are just sad. You know, it's just sad what, what you see. So for me, I wanted to get the word out that, you know, if you are a great player, there is a right way and you, you really want to do what's right early. And, you know, we have a saying that, you know, you can get paid now or you can get paid later. And we always tell our kids, you know, do it right, get the education, get the high GPA, go to the college that you can go and get an education. Let's do that first. But, um, you know, make sure you do it the right way and not just go play for guys because they're going to buy you a pair of shoes or they're going to get you free gear. Play for me. I'm not going to charge you. Pay for me. Play for me and I'll, I'll fly your parents wherever you want to go. And these guys aren't coaches. You know, they're, they're agents. They're uh, runners. So, I mean, I could go on for hours on, on the stuff I've seen. And I've been very fortunate because I've been division one assistant. I've coached high school in California for, you know, better than 12 years. Uh, I was a high school teacher. Um, I run my own program. I've assisted other kids and run their teams and programs. And then I ran events for 20 plus years, you know, and the, the amount of superstar NBA hall of famers that have come through our events um, at camps, uh, it, it's a long list. And uh, you know, the things we've seen, uh, I, I just didn't like, and it was hard to, to get the word out. So, and the, I've been asked to write a, a sequel to it. And I think I will, um, because it's about 10 years later now. So, but it's, it's a real dirty world. If you, if you don't do it right, if you don't have the right people in your corner to, to kind of, uh, protect you and do things the right way and, and find the right coaches. And what's the motivation? If I'm an AU guy that wants to get these players and, and pay them money, is the motivation to just say you've got good players? Is it to become an agent? Is it to get a kickback if the kid goes to the NBA? Is it to get well, a D1 I, assistant job? Everybody's different. Everybody's different. Like for me, I don't have any of those desires. I've been there, done that. Uh, I just want to make a difference. I want to get the kids better. I want to be influential. I want to mentor. But a lot of these other guys, they're ready to make money. You know, they need to make money. Um, they do things that are a little on the shady side just to make money. You know, they call these kids full payers and these kids are not. You know, we'll bring in all these guys and make them pay full price and they'll fund the other kids that we say we're charging, but we're not. Um, you know, sometimes they're looking for a coaching job. A lot of times they're looking to get it, which again is financial based. But I've seen so many guys trying to get coaching jobs, piggybacking off of kids. Uh, but it, it, for me, it's you have coaches that coach for the kids and then you have coaches that coach for themselves. Um, and it's pretty much cut and dry into those two categories. So you really want to find a program that this guy's not looking to go out there and use your kid to make money for himself. He's just going to go out there and do what's right for your son or your daughter. And then at the end of the day, you're going to build that relationship with that coach. I, like you, Corey, I coached you. I mean, I've coached so many hundreds of hundreds of kids that are still in touch with me today because there was a true honesty there in the coaching. It wasn't about using you to get more success. So um, you really have to know what the motivation is for, for a program and for a coach. And that's why finding some of these programs that have been around for a while, um, you can really find that out. And you know, this guy's not going to just jump ship because he got a D3 assistant offer. Um, he's going to say, I got my job. I'm out. You know, good luck to you guys. See you later. Um, you know, this, that's someone that's in it for the long haul. Yeah, that's great. Um, let me ask you this, Travis and, and Tom, tournaments. There are hundreds of tournaments across the nation, right? Is it important which tournament teams go to? Tom, why don't you start? Then Travis, you can you can follow up. Yeah, absolutely. I do believe that the schedule is very important. Um, again, it depends on what you're looking for. So, for example, we're hosting a tournament this weekend in Kentucky where um, we're going to have a lot of the um, – Division two NAI schools, uh, you know, a lot of the smaller schools will be at this event. Um, and these are mainly the Kentucky AAU programs that will be there, almost all of them. And most of the players um, there are recruitable for the schools that are going to be there because they're local. Um, they get to see them more. They're close to home, all of those different reasons. And so for an, an AAU program to not come to that tournament, but go to a tournament in, let's say, Kansas City, um, where your kids are still NAI and D3 kids, but you're going to Kansas City 
those D3s are not likely to recruit you for all the same reasons why I said the Kentucky team teams would recruit you. It's too far away. It's just not likely that you'd make it there four years, all those reasons why. And so I think it is very important to know who's on your team, um, the level that they are, and then go to the places where, again, the college coaches, scouts, and people that are either running those events or around those events are able to connect your players with college coaches of where they can actually play. And uh, this weekend with, with our event is just an example um, because, again, we'll have all types of people that can connect these kids with these college coaches and they will be there. Um, so I, I do think it's vitally important that you um, figure out exactly what your team is and go to the events that, that help them. Okay, and Travis, let me get more specific on that. Um, how do you set nationwide? You have to look right. How do you decide which AU events to go to? And then when you're there, which games to watch? Yeah. Um, it's really tough, um, to be honest with you. It's Tom nailed it. First off, I just want to say Tom nailed that at the absolute answer. You got to go places where, um, you're going to be recruited. Um, if you're a D3, D2 prospect, you got to stay local and go to tournaments like that. But for me at a national level, um, it's a lot of, a lot of work. Uh, you got to figure out the team list. You got to figure out the rosters, um, what kids are going to be playing, um, where they're going to be playing. It's all about, going to the place for me right now um, that – can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, it's all about going to the place where basically there's going to be the most players and especially players that I really haven't seen much that I need to get more familiar with. Um, it's just all about efficiency at this point. Um, so this weekend, it's funny that Tom brought up Kansas City. That's where I'm headed. Um, and mm -hmm. so – I chose Kansas city over a handful of other events, basically because there's um, some teams that I just frankly haven't seen, especially on the West coast. Um, so I, I need to go see that, that. And uh, when it comes to scheduling, I'm going to pinpoint um, the, the programs that historically um, have, have had the most players um, and try to watch um, them take on teams that I'm not familiar with as well. Cause as the summers go on, Say I'm watching um, Mocan Elite. They're an EYBL team, pretty easy. I would ideally at this early point in the summer, I'd like to watch them play a team that I'm unfamiliar with, see if I can find some new players, um, unearth some new guys um, and stuff of that nature. Because later in the summer, Mocan Elite, those EYBL teams um, will be playing each other. So I'm going to be much more familiar with each of them. It's just going to narrow down and that's where I'm going to be at. So during these points in times, I like to try to expand and see who else I'm going to watch. And that's kind of how I structure my schedules off of. It's going to be based around where the most um, historically known programs are, with the most historically known players, and kind of base my schedule around that while trying to find some new players throughout. Gotcha. And, you know, when I went to one of Dave's events in California about four or five years ago, the event had 24 courts, right? And there were four courts at the front majority of the college coaches were there especially all the d1 guys and there were kids and teams playing on court 24 and 23 can you give an example of finding a kid at an au event um that might have been on one of those smaller courts but you walked by or he just he bloomed in front of you and then from there you kind of wrote him up and and the rest is history yeah um there's a couple of them like that it Historically, it used to happen in Vegas. Vegas kind of has gotten a bad rap in recent years, especially with NCAA. They've basically kind of taken the Vegas um, events out that would close out summer every single year, where basically every single AU program in the country was there. Um, it's where the stories were. That's where all the stories were. It's where they all okay. were, so they shut it down. Um, so basically, yeah, so there would be several times where um, you'd go into a back gym in the middle of the world, I mean, you're talking maybe two coaches in the gym. Nobody's there. You just get basically a tip, a word of mouth. Hey, you need to check this kid out. And during those times, you're going to go check them out because that's what you're trying to do is you're trying to unearth new kids. You've already seen everybody else. Um, so two kids in particular, I'm forgetting one of their names, but one is named Cole Bajima. Uh, he ended up going to Michigan. Uh, forget the team he played for. It was, a, it was a big team. It wasn't a big AU program. But he goes out to Vegas, and it's just one of those things. He's in the back gym. Uh, word of mouth, hey, you need to go check this kid out. So we do. Uh, kid's a legitimate uh, potential high major player. You write up about him. 
sure enough, he gets a Michigan offer, and that's where he ends up. He's since transferred. Um, but the coolest story, I think, also happened in Vegas. Kid from Alaska, I blank on his name, uh, basically took 36 hours for him to travel all the way down to Vegas. Um, gets down there for the AU tournament. And it was, again, one of those back back gym things. He's playing with a no-name team. I mean, this is middle of nowhere, Alaska. Like, the kids he's playing with are five foot four, just not good basketball prospects or players. And he's a legit 6'9", 6'10", type kid. And uh, just by being at the right place, going to where all the AU coaches – or going all the AU teams are, going to where all the college coaches are, all the scouts are, um, he was able to kind of put himself in a place where he was able to be found and written about and then found a scholarship and go into a Division One program. Uh, another That's famous great. one, real quick, Corey, is uh, Javon Carter. Yeah. Um, who is now in the NBA. If you uh, th That story was told so many times where Hugs found him on, at an 8 a.m. game down at AAU Nationals. Everybody else is sleepy. I mean, it, it happens. And that's, again, the beauty of these events because, you know, uh, Javon Carter, again, I'll say rural Kentucky, you know, they're not going out there to find him. But at an 8 a.m. game on a random court at an AAU Nationals where there's 30 courts down there, he's found. And now he's, you know, with the Phoenix Suns and then and is probably going to enjoy a career in the NBA. Yeah, and DT, you get it. Dave, do you have a uh, one of those stories of a kid being found on a backcourt? Oh, there's a ton of them. I mean, we, we used to run camps out of California, you know, and, uh, you know, a lot of these guys from like the boozers of the world, guys that would come from these small states like Alaska, um, you know, or, or just states where you're thinking that, you know, you don't you don't have national prominent teams, nationally prominent teams. And they come to these camps. I, I really miss that, that we don't have camps anymore. The camp format, I thought, was was something that the college coaches really loved. I know I loved it, where you would have uh, skill session practice type drills in the morning. And then in the afternoon, after lunch, you'd have games. After dinner, you'd have games. But the college coaches loved coming to the morning session where they got to see the kids work out and see if they had to practice, how they practiced. Were they showing up on time? Did they have a lot of energy? Or do they just want to play games? But there are so many stories. I can give you a laundry list of players that came through our camps where – they were not ranked. They were not known. And next thing you know, they made the all-star team there. They made the top 20. And, uh, you know, then they're going to, you know, all kinds of Division One programs. So um, it's it's very true. You have to be where, where people are going to be. You have to be there. And I know for us, uh, we're very big on film. Uh, there's not a 17U game that we play, and I have four 17U teams that we don't film the game. I mean, I, I'd rather film the game than coach the game. Uh, the film is very important for the kids recruitment, because a lot of times these coaches, as, as I'm sure your, you know, your panel will tell you, um, he's scouting all over the place. He can't be at every court. He can't be at every game. And what if I had a game where one of my kids blew up and really was playing against a future division one player and really held his own and, and could prove that he could play at that level. Well, no one saw him because nobody heard of that program. Uh, we film it. We, we give it to our staff and we blast it out to other coaches and we put it on websites and, um, so picking a tournament is very important, but for me, uh, not just picking a tournament, but filming the games, you know, filming every single game to where, you know, just make a highlight reel. You can make your highlight reel, um, but have the full game where a college coach can see you play. Um, that's something that we think is very, very important because you do these scouts can't be at every game. So, uh, but they, these guys are right. Everything they said is hundred percent accurate. Um, you know, you go where you can be recruited the best and then, you know, if the coaches that you think should have been there to watch you, that they were watching the game on court two and they weren't watching you, um, you got film of it. So you can send that film to that coach and say, you missed me. Uh, but like you said, Corey, you've been to my event. There was 24 courts and, and people would say, do you put the guys way on, on 24? Are they the worst teams? No, they weren't. They were the younger teams, you know, or the teams without the, the, the rising stars that were going to be rising seniors. So, and it was just random, you know, we would get, you know, complaints from coaches. Why are we on court 24? We should be on court. Hey, it's just the way it works out, man. And, you know, if you're good, they'll find you, you know, coaches will find you if you're good. Like, like you said, you know, Hey, you got to watch this kid. This kid's pretty good. He's exactly right. The word gets out. So how do you get the and, word? And, if, I, if I'm a player, how do I get someone to advocate for me in that situation? Well, I mean, it comes down to your coach. I mean, he mm. has to do the work first of all. Um, he has to get the word out and he has to send the word out and it comes with film. It can't be just word of mouth, you know, because who's going to believe me if I'm talking about my kid, you know? So, um, but you'll, you'll get, 
like you get these scouts that are at different games, they'll see it. And when one guy sees it, it'll, it'll spread like wildfire. Hey, you got to see this kid over here on court nine. He's, I don't know anything about him, but man, he dominated that game. He's, he's big, he's athletic, blah, 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 blah. But um, that's the job of the AAU coach. It really is. You know, it, it's not just coaching and winning games. There's so much more that goes into it. And I had the, I have staff members that do that work for me because they're really good at it, but you got to You got to expose the kids. You got to get them exposure. You got to send it out and let the coaches see the film. And I'll send the film saying, Hey, this kid's a division two prospect. I think he could help your program. Give him a look. If you don't think he's a good fit, let me know. Let me know your opinion of it. Cause I have a lot of coaching contacts having coached so long. So they'll get back to me and say, you know what? He's not good enough for, for our team, but he's really good enough for my brother who's coaching down here. So I'm going to forward that there. And it just is a cyclical process. So um, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work for, you know, Tom and, and people that run programs. It's not just like rolling the ball out there and coaching. You, you got to do a lot more than that. It's a lot of behind the scenes. You have no idea that goes on. I will say one thing about the film situation. This would really probably be directed more towards um, the people that run AAU or no, I'm sorry. Yeah. Run AAU programs and not, you know, like myself, I just run the events, but um the film is so crucial. What Dave's talking about is the film is, is so crucial. And if let's say if I have a team where um, I have some players that I think are college players, my biggest, uh, but they're, let's say they're not on the scene yet. My biggest goal is to get film of them playing against kids that have been deemed definitely college players. And oftentimes you'd be surprised if you, you know, if you call the event operator, I tell every new AAU coach that comes to me that I consult with, get to know the event operators, become their best friends. See how you can make their life easier um, because you can go to those uh, AAU event directors and say, I've got some kids that I think are college level, load my schedule up. Because in AAU, it's not really about wins. Uh, Travis is not going to rank a kid higher because his team won the tournament. Um, it's, and it's not to say that winning doesn't matter. I'm not saying that. We're talking strictly about college recruitment here. But um, you'd be shocked if you go to the tournament director and say, hey, I want the hardest three pool play games that you can possibly give me just because I want film. I want film that, of my kids playing against other college players that are definitely college players. What Dave keeps talking about with the film, it's just so crucial. And that will open up more eyes as opposed to saying, you know, playing a super easy schedule, going just for the wins and saying, hey, college coach, my team won this tournament. They don't, they don't care. Show them film against college basketball players and that'll get your kids recruited. And Travis, let's, let's shoot that over to you. I mean, if you're going to an event, you've probably got tons of people saying, hey, come check me out. But, you know, when, before you go in the event, are you doing your own research through known guys? I, I know you said your strategy earlier was trying to see other teams, but if there's a team not in your list, what's going to pique your interest to go check out a kid on court 20? Is it a trusted source? Is it someone sending you a highlight tape that just gets through your filter? Because it has to have happened in the past, I'm sure, right? Happens all the time. Um, and, and it's one of those things where um, it takes time to figure out. It, to me, it's all trusted sources. Um, it, it Highlight film, scouring through film at this point. Um, it's just very difficult to get to all of the film that's sent to me. And it's very um, trying process. Um, so a lot of it comes down to trusted sources and um, kind of picking, going back to what Dave was saying when it comes to um, AU coaches getting you the right exposure, or getting your name out there. He's absolutely right. Um, but at the same time, you have to have the right AU coach because um, there's a, a bunch of them out there that will, uh, send me a text or give me a call and say, Hey, you need to come look at this kid. He's the best. Like he's the, he's a top 25 prospect, whatever it is. And especially at the beginning of me taking this position at 24 um, seven, I was trying to figure out who could be my trusted sources in those regards. And I go watch them and the kids not even like a division one player. Um, so from that point on, if that coach ever calls me, I'm not going to go watch his kids because I don't trust you, what you say. Um, now there's, a, but there are a bunch of good people out there um, that know what they're doing, know what they're talking about in it for the right reasons. And when they pick up the phone, they call me and say, Hey, you've got to watch this kid. I'm absolutely going to make sure I, I go to court 24 to go watch him. Travis, David. Let, let, let me, I'm sorry, Corey, just, just real quick. That's kind of a follow-up because again, I work with a lot of um, new AAU coaches that pop up every single year. 
Um, you don't know them. You wouldn't be able to trust them. If somehow they got filmed to you that says, you know, Corey Heights scores 36 points against Team Fed 17U EYBL, and it's, it is on film, do you have to trust that coach to look at the film and say, okay, he really did just drop 36 and he's six foot five. Maybe I need to look a little bit deeper in that. Uh, I'm trying to find ways for the, the newer AAU coaches to overcome the fact that they've not been around long enough right. um, to where you could even trust them. But that's where, again, the importance of the film and the importance of playing a tough schedule um, can help overcome what Travis is talking about, where if I don't know you, at least if you send me a, a film with that in the headlines, then it could, you could have a chance. Agreed. And I agree with that because um, there's, there does, there is times where that happens. And um, if, if it is playing against team that or, or another EYPL Adidas or Under Armour, just shoe circuit team in general, um, a lot of people give me a phone call. Hey, this kid went off for 50 points last week, whatever it is. And it's like, did they actually really? So yes, having that <sighs> film is very important. Um, did they there's, really? so, there's this, this business is just very funny and, and just, uh, the amount of, um, I guess, uh, what the legendary fish stories, if you will, where a kid goes out, scores 50 points. It's like, no, they, they actually did. So, yes, <laughs> having yeah. that film is very important if it, when those circumstances come. And um, then it comes down to me doing my homework. If that When that happens, now I'm going to start making phone calls, um, start calling people that I trust that were around the situation at the time and then watch the film and then go from there. And you know what? The right AU coaches are not going to blow smoke up a kid and try to pump him up to a higher level than he should be, right? Correct. Because they yeah. know they're in it for the yeah. long term. Yeah. And if they blow their integrity, that's it. They've ruined that yeah. for right. years to come. It's like Tom said. It's like Tom said. If I, if I say this kid's D1 and he's not D3, and then why is anybody going to listen to me again? You know, so, you know, I just I just got, in, you know, asked to go to an event this weekend um, in New Jersey. And and that's like, like Tom, that's the first question they'll ask me. You know, I know you have some college players. How many college players do you have on your team? Well, I have uh, nine guys, okay, that I think are going to play in college. Five are going to be D3, uh, two are going to be D2, and I have a couple guys that are borderline D1. You know, you don't lie to them. You know, you say, this is what we got, you know, because then if you do lie to them, you're never going to have the trust of these guys again. And these event operators, like Tom said, they're huge, you know. So, you know, I want them to want me at their events, you know, and – and uh, they'll call me and say, we need you, we need you out here because we heard you had Josh Reeves and he went D1 and he's a very good player. And do you have anybody else that's that? Yeah, I have some D2s. And, you know, I got a couple of guys that I think are on that fence. But um, for me, like I said, and both these guys have reiterated it, for us and our program, the film is brutal. I spend more hours on film. And, and as a program, I run my own program. I will be physically sitting at a court on an 11U game and filming the game. And that's obviously not for recruitment purposes. That's for developmental purposes. That's where I go home, break the film down, show this 11 year old that the reason why you're not playing more is because you can't see man and ball and you don't see man and ball, then you're counter. So film, I want my kids in my program to get used to film where I'm really critical with them, where it doesn't hurt their feelings. And then as you get older and you're 15, 16, 17, I'll critique the film and then I'll send it to them raw. And then with that raw film, you know, then I have guys that will send emails with links to these film sessions and these and these games and then let the, you know, let the people out there like Travis and other people that know what they're doing, let them figure out where they think that player lands. But I'll just say, I think this is a college player. You tell me what level you think he's at, you know, but watch number 24 in red, 6'4", 220, you know, 32 inch vertical and really fundamental. He can play the two. Tell me your thoughts, you know, and I think that Without that film, you can't just tell a guy that. You got to have backup. So these guys are 100% right. And this is a pet peeve uh, of yours, Dave, but full game tape versus highlights. Travis, if you get a tape, do you want to see a three minute highlight or you want to see a full game tape to wet your whistle? Uh, I personally do not like highlights all that much. Uh, everybody, I think, shoots about 100% in those things. So it's very <laughs> difficult. It's very difficult to get a gauge on uh, a player in those. Um, so, yes, highlights can catch my eye, um, but I'm going to need that full game tape, uh, preferably two to three games. Um, and I always, always want to see – like, I don't want to see your best games either. Um, I, I like to see uh, a game where you struggle. What do you, how are you impacting the game when you're, when you're not at your best? Um, I think those are incredibly valuable and something like if a coach asked me for film of a kid, 
I typically will find a couple games that I think show um, the full picture of a kid. And one of those will typically include a game film where they struggle. Hmm. That's the first time I've ever heard that. I think that's unique. Yeah. And I think that, you know, Corey and I have gone back and forth on this because, you know, I'm really against the highlight tape because like you said, I can go out here right now and make a pretty good highlight tape of myself. You know, you, I can cut that thing up for three minutes and I look like I could play. And then you watch after I shoot, I can barely walk off the court. So, you know, it's, it's, uh, I do understand that coaches are going to want to see the highlight to whet their appetite, but there's no reputable coach that I know that's going to recruit a kid off a highlight tape. And then you really make a fool out of yourself if your highlight tape represents nothing like the game tape, you know, and a highlight tape, I could be playing against, you know, you know, lesser known players, JV guys and light it up. Um, to me, a highlight tape is, is, you know, means absolutely nothing to me. Um, but then again, I'm not someone that's a professional that's ranking players. So it's good to get their perspective. Um, but for me, I don't want my kids making highlight tapes, but Corey will tell me you need a highlight tape. So I'll say, okay, make a highlight tape, but make sure you have three films. And it's exactly what he said. Play, have a game where you struggled against talent. And so they can see your body language, see your effort, see how you come off the court, see how you sit on the bench see how you, you support your team and they're doing well when you're on the bench, you're standing up and you're being a great teammate. Those things do matter, you know, and sprinting off the court, sprinting on the court, missing a shot and getting back and taking the charge. Um, those are things that, that you don't see on highlight tapes. So uh, the game film, and I don't want to see edited game film either. I'm going to see the whole game. You know, you can tell me when you were in, I was in at these points. I was not in, but I want to see you on the bench. You know, I want to see how you behave on the bench. And when I was a Division One coach, I wanted to see how they behaved on the bench because I coached at a school where you had to have grit and toughness and attitude and, and you couldn't just be pouting and moping and have bad body language. So um, I want to see the entire game. And, yeah, you can tell me and trim it as far as these are the moments I'm in the game. But I'm still going to watch and see if I can see you on that bench. So And watching the score, I think Tom mentioned this or someone mentioned this, um, I could care less. I almost want to see if you're down 30 how you play. You know, how do you play when you're down 15 and 20? Everybody is hard when you're up 15 and playing well. But if you're down 20 and you're struggling and this team is better, uh, I want to see how you fight through that. I, I, I know you're going to look good when you're playing well. How do you look good when you're not? So everything comes back to film to me. You know, it's all film and it's all actual game film. The, the one thing I'll say in regards to the highlights, though, is that I, I've seen it happen too many times and it frustrates me to no end that but uh, let's say I'm potentially talking with a college coach about a player saying, yeah, he's good. I think he's good. I think he's good enough to play for you or whatnot. I've seen, I've seen it happen too many times where finally I get a hold of a clip of a kid jumping up and just cramming all over another kid or uh, something where he hits 10 or 11 threes in a game. That's a highlight. It is a highlight, maybe a 15, 30, two minute highlight. It grabs their attention. It does grab the, and I've seen kids go from, you know, oh, I don't know if he's high major D1. And then on one weekend, he goes up and takes off from outside of the paint and dunks on somebody. And the next thing I know, he's high major D1. Nothing's really changed except they saw that short clip to show that he's athletic enough or that he really can shoot with range or that he really can defend. And th those little things, I, I don't think that they're, that highlight films are completely useless by any means um, because it's also difficult to, for, for a player to, be completely off the radar and then send the coach a game film. The coach has no prior knowledge of the kid. It, it does seem difficult with as busy as coaches are that they're actually going to sit down for an hour and 15 minutes or however long a game lasts and watch a game film on a kid that they've never seen before, unless it's coming from a trusted source. But even still there, there's lots of trusted sources that these coaches have. So I'm not completely anti-highlight just because I've seen a change. I've seen highlights change kids' lives. Um, and I, think, I think you're right. And I think you're right, Tom. But, but it also, you can't just, my point is, yeah, it's going to whet your appetite, but That's you're going to have That's to it. still watch an actual game. You know, Oh, that guy looks Absolutely. pretty good. I have to now yeah. see the actual game. And I, I'm with you. I get it. Yeah. You can have a guy that's out there being spectacular, but then you watch the actual games and you see, he doesn't do that against talented players. He does that against JV talent. So you're right. You're hundred percent right. That, that that'll turn somebody on. And now with the Twitter and the Instagram and, uh, you know, the, in, the clips that go on these things and the, YouTubes, but um, at the end of the day, that those highlights are going to whet your appetite. They're going to say, "Wow, that's an athletic play." That that okay. Yeah. Let me see something now. Let me watch them. And that's when you now have they to watch have film, them. right? Yeah. Right. And that's You're right. I'll, yep. And I'll spit in my opinion on this is that yes, it's there to whet your appetite because coaches nowadays at all levels, prep schools, which I deal with, you know, some of these guys are teaching three classes, or they're in the admissions department, or they have families, and you know, 
uh, I admire Travis having the time to actually sit down and watch all these tapes, but these guys don't have that. But what you do is you have the highlight, you know, you have the transcripts. If that wets the whistle, then you've got the full game tape of the good quarter or the good half right after that to look more into it. So I work with some prep school coaches. They see a minute, they look at the money, look at the transcript. If it's good, find out the kid's a good kid, it's game on. I have other prep school coaches I work with look at the highlights, watch two full game tapes because they're very invested on picking the right kid for their program. So it's a case by case basis, but I'm going to err always on the side of having highlights, just knowing how time strapped everyone is out there. And for those of you listening that are not in this world, making the highlights is an art too. You know, you always want to put your top highlights in the first 30 seconds. Do not put in free throws. That's one of my pet peeves. Do not put in a highlight where you break a kid down, pass it, and the kid misses. Do not put in a highlight where you break a kid down and miss a shot, okay? Or highlights because they have to be makes. And I could make a highlight tape of the worst highlights I've ever seen, and people would just shake their heads. Also, uh, and I'm going to do a, uh, a call out here to Dave Taylor, do not put cones in your highlights. You know, when you're doing a workout tape, don't put cones in and don't go half speed. I, I just got a highlight tape today with a kid that had cones and he's going half speed doing these dribble drills with two balls. And that was the first five minutes of this workout video. And no coach is going to, you're never going to do that in a game. You're never going to go half speed. You're never going to have two balls. And I think it just needs to be almost a PSA public service announcement on how to build a highlight tape. So that's my two cents right there. If you guys got any highlights, or any suggestions on highlight tapes, please pipe in. Quickly, uh, I'll say don't put anything on your highlight film that you don't actually do in games. Um, if you are not a shooter and you hit, you know, you've hit three threes all season long, I probably would not put those three threes on your highlight tape. Um, because again, the trust factor, like what Travis and, and Dave are talking about, it's, it'll just be out the window and they will, you know, you, you'll immediately be out at that point. So, um, if you are an amazing defender, great. Find highlights of you locking people down, sliding your feet. If you're a great rebounder, let's see your positioning. Let's see how you're doing on the weak side. Let's see all those different things. So build it towards your strengths and not towards the player that you wish to be one day. You know, the college coaches have figured that out when they, when they get you on campus or just basically by watching your film. They're going to be able, once they get to the full game film level, they're going to be able to dictate and project pretty solid. Uh, what you can be in college. So only put your strengths on the highlight films. Don't, don't try to do too much. You're not going to be able to lie your way to a college scholarship. It's impossible. Yeah, and don't put explicit music on as your, as your background music. That should go without saying. I've seen, yeah. Well, I've, I've seen third grade basketball player highlights with explicit, <laughs> explicit music. It's, it's, you know, it's interesting out here. That, that could be a whole other podcast for us, Corey. Yeah, yeah about sure. highlights. Um, let's go back to running events and Dave and Tom, I know you've done this. You guys are almost like gatekeepers to where when college coaches come in, they don't have time to go through maybe the whole packet. Um, they might know a few kids, but they're going to come to you guys as well and say, Hey, I'm seeing these five kids who are five others. I need to see that maybe are under the radar. Can you guys expand on that a little bit and how tournament directors can actually help or hinder a kid? Yeah. I mean, I've run, high level national events, you know, with, with top rated players. And uh, I'll get that all the time. Hey, Dave, I need a shooter. Give me, give me five shooters. I need a, you know, I need a big, that can just rebound and run a lane. You know, I need this and that. And give me somebody that, that nobody knows about, you know, and I'll say, this is a kid over here for, you know, Idaho select. Who's, who's way under the radar, but watch the kid. He can run like a gazelle. He's six, nine, he's two forty. You know, he's, he can rebound. He can run. He's, he, he's really good. Um, you know, and then, they really, you know, once you do that and you shift them that way, then it becomes almost a competitive thing where these coaches come in and they say, okay, don't tell anybody else, you know, and I say, no, I, you know, I tell everybody, man, I'm here to, you know, work the events, but I, as an event guy who ran these tournaments with 24 courts and, and five day events back in the good old days where, you know, you see all these teams constantly and you see the coaches and you see everybody you really do know. And I'm, I'm pacing back and forth, making sure that the violations are being uh, held to a minimum you know, and the coaches are doing their job and not talking to kids and things like that. But yeah. you see every game. So they know that and they know you're there all day and they might be going to two or three events in the area. So they will always want that shortcut. And they'll come up to me and from D2 to D1 to D3 and they'll say, find me a kid that, that I can go watch that I can get that, that would be interested. And uh, I've, I've built really good relationships off of that. So, 
yeah, when you run events, you're, you are the gatekeeper and they'll come to you first and foremost. And, uh, and then they know if you've coached before and you've played before that they will value your opinion. You know, you're not just, you know, some guy who's never touched the ball before and you're just trying to make money. So, you know, for Tom and myself, we've been there, done that. So they'll, we'll have a little more weight with what we say. And we don't have a, you know, we're not talking about our own kids. You know, it's like, Hey, that guy, he plays for me. No, we, we talked about everyone else, you know, so you really get the respect of these guys. And then when they watch and they say, you know what, you're right on. Thank you. And then you develop that relationship with these coaches that last, you know, I have, you know, dozens and dozens of coaches. That I still text and talk to today that that's how we got to know each other. And now it's, you know, it's a relationship where they'll call me after a game and say, I'm going to send you something. Tell me what you think, you know? So um, yeah, you are the gatekeeper and you got to take that very serious. You know, you can't, just throw guys out there because you like the guy or you like the, the coach or the program because you'll lose that reputation and they'll never listen to you again. Yeah. So, so when you build up events over time, doing your research before the event starts on who was playing for what team, the good players, the good team, um, and formulating your matchups um, correctly to where the teams are happy. Um, the college coaches are happy and each team is really getting kind of what they want out of this situation. It takes, it takes a lot of research. Um, you, it's not just uh, auto schedule, you know, on a on some kind of scheduling tool where just random matchups happen. Um, now, I'll say that happens a lot. There's a lot of auto schedule going on, um, but but for the tournaments that are really doing it right and have good reputations, you know, it, it, we have to do a lot of research. And so we do find out who the good who the the good players are and those different things. And and the bit of advice that I tell every AAU coach that I come in contact with is make great relationships with the tournament directors um, just because like Dave was saying, it, it happens. It's happened with me for, for a while now, the, it starts with some college coaches asking, then you get to know some scouts. And if you know what you're talking about, they will call you back and they'll ask for your opinion. Um, and, and the most of the time with the uh, tournaments that have good reputations the tournament directors that have good reputations, they're very plugged in. Um, when it comes to the recruiting world where, uh, you know, they can make phone calls that could change your players' lives. So um, th there is a lot, but, but yes, I would say it's a, it's a huge responsibility that Dave would probably agree with me on this. Not, um, not a ton of tournament directors take it as seriously as they needed to, frankly. It's just a, a way to make money over the weekend. And um, the kind of disdain that Dave seems to have, you know, sometimes for the AAU coaches that I understand, I have the same disdain for most of these other tournament directors that, make it harder on the guys that are really trying to do it the right way for the right reasons. Um, and, you know, the, the, but yes, the, the, just because of how, because, and I, I get that way because of how important it is for the future of these kids. Um, and it's a very selfish way to, you know, to go about things, but get with the right guys and just be a, um, my advice to AAU coaches and parents, oh my goodness, parents of the players. If, if any of you guys are here, listen, um, the tournament directors that you're cussing out because the referee wasn't good on court six at 8 a.m. or whatever it might be, that is impacting your child's ability to be recruited. And that is just, I, I'm not exaggerating. And it's not even anything personal. It's not like I'm taking this personal. But when a college coach calls and says, hey, tell me about the family. Am I supposed to say, oh, my goodness, man, the parents are amazing. They're reasonable people. And they will not call you when, when little Johnny's not playing all the minutes that he wants. They're easy to get along with. Because Dave and I have the um, responsibility for all of the kids that will play in our events now and in the future to where we have to tell Travis, scouts, college coaches, we have to tell them the truth about these kids and about everybody around them, the handlers around them, anybody that's around them, we have to tell them the truth. And uh, that is so that we can help all the other kids and so that mine and Dave's reputation aren't, it isn't hurt to where we can't help kids anymore at that point. And so um, uh, different AAU coaches, parents, family members, fans, um, everything that you say and do out there and the way that you act and carry yourself um, has a tremendous impact on the player themselves. And I've seen it happen way too many times where kids have high major one, high major division one potential, and they end up at, uh, you know, lower than what they should have done because of the foolishness that, that's around them during these games. And let me and that's, a whole, that, that's a whole separate podcast. We could do that next week. I mean, that, that's, Let's do he's it. so right. That's an hour and a half, two hours right there. And I, I, just to piggyback on that, it's kind of a funny story, but I was at, a, you know, I, we had a tournament this last weekend and we have live stream on everything. So I'm in an airport and it's eight in the morning and we have an 8 a.m. game and I'm sitting in Baltimore and I'm like, okay, let me just catch this live stream. And the mic picks up some things, you know? So the mic is 
I'm hearing some comments and I don't know if it's my parents. It's, it's a, I think it's like a 14 U game. And I don't know if it's my parents or the other parents, but I sent the film of that game. And as Corey will tell you, I went on about an hour and a half tirade about exactly what Tom said. I said, you guys have no idea how much you are damaging your child. Shut your mouth, support your kid, keep your comments to yourself, cussing out a ref, cussing out a coach, cussing out the other players. It, it, it's going to ruin your child's future. And you have no idea because you're just basically an idiot. So um, it is, that's a whole separate three hour topic, but he is hundred percent right. The people that surround you, we always say you are who you hang out with. So if you're hanging out with, with scumbags or idiots and his mommy and daddy are screaming and cursing out, then we know you're getting that at home and you're finding that to be acceptable. I don't want that in my program. And as a former division one coach, I would never recruit a player that if I sat in the stands and was watching their parents and they behave like that, I would never recruit that kid. So Tom, that's a great topic. We could talk about that in two weeks and, and fill three hours. And Travis, this is come back to you or comes back to you. If you saw that in the stands, would that affect your opinion of the kid and how you rank them? Um, you got to be careful and ranking. It's sticky. I mean, that's the best way to put it. It's sticky. Well, well, uh, Travis is just, Travis. Correct, correct me if I'm wrong, Travis, but you are mainly your focus is top 100, top 200 kids like in the country. The most talented, the most talented. Is that is that correct or? Our, uh, somewhat correct. Yeah. Uh, I, I evaluate kids from low major all the way to high major. Yeah. Um, and I help, I, and I'll help those low major kids and mid major kids find, uh, future suitors in a way, um, just evaluating and passing names and stuff along to coaches. Um, so I do evaluate all the way from low, all the way to high. Um, I've done it across the country and I have done it internationally as well. Um, so back to the question of uh, does parents and people around the kid impact um, the ultimate ranking, I guess, of a kid in some circumstances, you do have to kind of take it into consideration, but you do have to be careful because um, at the end of the day, it is the kid um, that you have to be evaluating and not so much people around them, but obviously um in certain some, some circumstances you do have to take it into consideration i think you know i think yeah topic. i think to to defend travis a little bit i think that's not really travis's job i think he's there to evaluate talent and tell you what the talent looks like and and he ranks the kid and he says the kid's a top 20 player then you know it's the college coach that then does the the due diligence and contacts tom you know i heard he was at your event how did that go uh contacts dave taylor i heard you played against him uh what did you see or hear um, I, I don't think a scout's job is necessarily to do that. I, you know, I run the Phenom camp and I've been running that since it started, uh, you know, and we'll get some wackadoodles out there with parents, you know, just the parents that are just lunatics and that will affect us picking them for an all-star team. I'll tell you that much. Like if we're picking an eighth grade all-star team or 10th grade all-star team and the parents are lunatic and the kid, you know, is, is talking to his parents, it, it'll affect that. And I'll let the parents know that. I'll say, if you keep talking and you keep being disruptive, then your kid's going to not make an all-star team that he really has a right to be on because we're going to send you a message that uh, you're not going to go anywhere because no one's going to recruit your child because of the way you behave. Um, I, again, I, I've not seen too many scouting services or scouts that would go out and say much about a parent unless he like walked on the court and punched a ref or something. But um, I, I don't think that's their job. I, I don't think it's his job to, to, tell, to tell me what kind of parents or background they have. It's his job to tell me how good the kid is. And if the kid's good, then it's my job to go out and find out if there's any baggage. And we always will find the baggage. I call tournament directors like Tom and say, you know, if he's been in your tournaments for five years, tell, talk to me about the family. You know, has there been any issues? And he'll say yes or no, because he's not going to lie. You know, then I'll contact. I don't always contact the head coach of that kid. I contact coaches that, that have played him or coaches that are, that are familiar with that kid as going up against him or maybe familiar with the fact that he, he's, he's played in their league. And I'm not going to just take their opinion because there could be biases there too, but I just want to hear everything that, that is around that kid. And uh, I, I don't think it's Travis's job to tell me that, that the parents are a little you know, out there. And speaking of parents, David, one, one Sunday morning, I woke up and looked at ESPN and one of the headlines was LeVar Ball ejected from California AAU event. And I knew that was your event. And I immediately texted you and said, Oh boy, you made the top five headline on ESPN. What happened? <laughs> 
and you told me about it, but that's one of the all time uh, most uh, visible parents in basketball recruiting history right there. And you dealt with him on a year to year basis, but you know, you actually had a pretty positive opinion of him. I have a, I had a great relationship with the entire family, his wife, um, uh, you know, and, and all the kids, the kids were always great for me. And I had a great relationship with the dad and uh, he and I, he, he had respect for me and he treated me with respect and I had the same for him. And, and uh, he would come to me, you know, and ask me for questions and his, his, his father, um, you know, the, the ball's grandfather was a fantastic guy. I talked to him for hours at a time. Um, very good people, but you know, LeVar would go a little nuts and uh, they were playing in a championship game. There must've been, you know, 200 people watching and probably 50, 75 high, high level coaches. And uh, he got a technical and he's supposed to sit down. And uh, I walk over, I said, LeVar, man, you got to sit. And he goes, he goes, I'm not sitting, my back hurts. And I said, listen, man, if I know your back doesn't hurt. You know me, I, you got to sit. If you don't sit, I got to call the game. And he's like, DT, I do know you. You do what you got to do. So I called the game. It was before halftime and the game was over. And I said, he's out. You know, he didn't follow the rules and he wasn't going to sit. And, and it did make national headlines. And he didn't look at me. And he, the next day I saw him, he gives me a hug. He says, I knew you would do it. Yeah, I, I called your bluff. And, you know, I won't do that again. But, uh, yeah, I, they were at all of our events, you know, and it was a show. You know, they were having a reality show following them. And they were doing shoe signings and gear this and gear that. And, um and they had obviously very talented players because, you know, two or three of them are going to be, you know, top three picks overall. So I think four of them, not just the brothers, but the two brothers and a couple other guys around that team. So um, but they were fun. You know, they were they were not the, the nightmares that people think for me uh, personally. But uh, I know they were nightmares for others. But that, that goes with the territory when you run an event. You know, you get some of these high guys and you got to know they're coming. You got to put them on the right court. You got to have the right people around the court and you got to manage it. So. Uh, but those are nothing but great memories. But yeah, you were you were right. I remember you texted me too. And other, I got about 200 texts on that. And they saw me on the highlights, some of them. So, um, but th those are great days. Yeah, a question that came in from one of the viewers uh, is about camps, right? And I always have a lot of families ask me like, which camp should we go to? And, you know, being on the East Coast, you know, I knew about the Hoop Group Camp, the Hoop Group Elite Camp, the Hoop Group All Academic Camp. And I know there's others across the nation, but... Um, are these camps normally run the same weekend as live AU events? And if so, what's more important going to a camp where there's going to be a lot of coaches and good competition or playing with your AU team or guys, let me know what your thoughts are on that. I'll ask Tom. I, mean, I, I like to know what Tom thinks. I don't think there's a lot of camps out there that are live. I, I have, you know, I think they're mainly all tournaments. You know, the days of the, of the high level NCAA live period camps are kind of gone. Um, like the Phenom camp is one of the best camps. It's been running for 15 years. It's, invitation only nike's involved with it it's a it's a high level camp that i've been running forever and we run it as a developmental camp you know we want to teach you what it takes to get to the next level and and there'll be rankings but it's never during a live period it's never during even any high level tournaments that we know are going to be out there um like a you know a vegas or anything like that that there have these local younger events um, we don't want to conflict with that because we want to get all the kids at our event so um the phenom camp does a fantastic job with all of that and the ranked players, it's a laundry list of NBA players that have gone to those camps. It really is. It's like 40, 50 deep. Um, but the, I don't know, Tom, you tell me, I, I don't see a lot of camps like they used to run. I used to run the, the superstar camp with the pumps and that was a phenomenal format and it just went by the wayside. And now it's just all quick money and get out there and run tournaments. And like you said, Tom, there's a lot of guys that just do it to make money um, and they just pop up everywhere and it's hard to get certified. A lot of work behind it, but yeah. um, they, they are, they are everywhere. Yeah, so I, I don't see many live period camps um, either, although there are good, there are still good camps with good opportunities. If you somehow get an invite to the NBA Top 100 camp, there's, there's plugged in people that run that. There are still some really good ones out there, but not necessarily during live period. I see the question that was texted in by Noel, was the, um, which is a good question. I'm actually asked quite a bit, but how much value do you put on college sponsored camps? Um, and for me, my response is typically always, well, are you paying to go to the camp? And 99% of the time, yes, it's a, it's a college. It can be a reputable college. There's nothing wrong with that. But, but, you know, sometimes it's under the guise of, Hey, come to our camp and maybe we'll recruit you. Um, but if you're paying to go to that camp, they're not going to recruit you. It, it is, it's a great way for college coaches to make some extra money over the summer. Most of them are really, really well run. Um, and you, you learn a lot um, on, from a lot of these camps, but 
um, if you're, you know, if, if you're going to uh, name your college camp and you're paying to go there, then it's, it's, you're not going to be recruited at, at that camp. They're, you're helping with some bonuses and some coaches' salaries and different things like that. Although good camps, I'm not knocking those camps. Tom, you're 100% right. Uh, I ran one of those. You know, we, I was coaching D1. Uh, we had camps and we did make nice bonuses, you know, on those camps. And, um, you know, and you're 100% right. I've always said that the college sponsor camps. Now, if they really were interested, they wouldn't charge you. And if they did, why would they want to see you at an event where the other kids really aren't that good? Um, you know, they're all just coming in as full campers. And then that money goes to the, to the assistant coaches. And that's how they get their big bonus for the year. Um, that was the way it was for me. Um, and that was a big camp for us. You know, we ran three different weeks and, and never once did we have one recruit attend one of those camps. So um, <laughs> it was all about, you know, getting that bonus. And like you said, we ran the camp well. Uh, it was good a very camp. fundamental camp and kids would get better and go to high school and be good high school players. And, and maybe down the road, maybe they would get to a D3 or D2. But uh, we, I personally, the years that I was there running those camps or not running them, but participating in them as a coach, we never had one recruit attended. So um, great question. And uh, it's something I tell kids all the time that they'll tell you different things, but they need the money. So uh, don't, don't be fooled by, by college sponsored camps. They're good camps. If you want to get better fundamentally, especially for younger kids, but don't think you're going there and they're going to recruit you. Well, I will pipe in with this. So I do know a lot of kids have their dream schools, right? And I will say, look, you can go to this camp and you will play in front of every single coach in the coaching staff. So you will be seen, right? So, and that's all you can guarantee are eyeballs on you that might not see you in any other situation. But at a lot of these Ivy League camps, you'll have other Ivy League coaches show up. You'll have high academic D3 coaches show up. So say you're going there uh, to Yale's camp and you're trying to get Yale's coaches to look at you. They're going to see you. And whether they recruit you or not, it's probably a low chance. But guess what? Amherst might be there or Williams and you might be more their level. You might have their academics that work now you're just exposed to a new college that didn't know about you before. So you well, are right. I, I think it's, that's a different, that, that's a different topic though, Corey. That's okay. That's not the camp we're talking about. We're talking about, you know, um, Dave Taylor university is throwing a camp together. There's no coaches there. You know, there's no, if I'm running an event, like let's say the Yale camp, like you said, and, the, and I advertise that other college coaches are going to be there. That's a whole different conversation. And we're talking, I'm talking about the camp where, you know, Dave Taylor University is running this camp, come to it and have a chance to play in front of the, you know, Dave Taylor University camp coaches and, and, you know, get a chance to get recruited. No, that that's what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about camps where um, other college coaches are going to be in attendance. That's a, that's a whole different conversation. Those are worthy of going to, but um, if, if you think you're going to go to a college sponsored camp where they're just pretty much promoting themselves, um, that that's a different, that's a whole different conversation. You're not getting a lot of college coaches going to an Air Force Academy daycare camp. You know, you're not going to get a lot of college coaches popping in to look at the 12 year old, you know, so or the nine, the nine year old or even the 15 year old. So, um, you know, I don't think anybody should be going to those camps that thinks that they're into that delusion. But like you said, Corey, if I'm going to go to Syracuse and Syracuse is running a camp, why not? I'll put my well, two hundred three hundred dollars in there and go see if they coach if the coaches watch me. Hey, who knows? But worst case scenario, they, they, they didn't mind. They didn't know my name when I got there. and They don't know it now. But at least you got to play in front of them, and that's something you could say. Maybe just to clarify, there's the, the week-long camps, right, which are a lot of those are daycare facilities. And then there's the elite camp, which are sometimes just the two-day yeah. invites. Totally different. That, yep. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. The two-day invites, that's different, all right? That's where there might be 50 to 100 kids. Half of them might have been invited for free. The other half are paying their money. That's where, if you're a player, I would only do that in a situation. If it's a dream school of yours, I wouldn't do that randomly. As far as the week-long camps, that should be for younger kids or kids not as serious because, yeah, the exposure is not there. So um, I think that clarification needs to be made. All right, last question here for the night uh, comes from Steve. Uh, Dave, with your film sessions, do you do those immediately after games or do you put them on a library and have kids access them at later dates? Or do you do when it's fresh? I, you know, what's your thoughts on that? I do when it's fresh. Yeah, I do it week to week. Uh, very rarely, like if I know I have a team that's going to be off the following weekend, I might put them on the back burner and do them later, but I want to get the film back to the kids before their next game. So uh, if they have a game on sat on Saturday and they played the previous Saturday, I want that game film in their hands with my critique by Wednesday, you know, so um, I will always keep it fresh and I will always, and I, and I can't do every team every weekend because we have too many teams, but they'll get one at least every two weeks. Um, especially if they're younger, like 11, you film, there's only so much you can do, you know, Hey, I do a half, half, 
maybe a half a game and say, look, here's the things we got to work on. And then when I go all the way up to 15, 16, 17, and we have girls teams too, uh, we'll dissect it. One film session could be two hours. You know, it could be two hours of me talking and diagramming and drawing on the, on the, on the TV screen and drawing where they should have been. And then, and then I'll send it to them and then I'll give them 24 to 48 hours and I'll quiz them on it. You know, on, on the film, did you hear what I said in the second half at this point? What, the, what, what were we talking about? You know, and um, so, yeah, I always want to give it back immediately. And then they, it's theirs to keep. So when they get the film, they can download it and keep it on their computer and they can reference it for years to come. You know, and I have a lot of parents that I have players like, you know, players that you've helped get into prep schools that I have on film when they were 11 and 12. And the parents still have that film, you know, so it's like a memory. But, uh, yeah, you have to keep it fresh. You can't wait. Because in six months, you can be a whole different player. So you, or six weeks, you can be a whole different player. So you really want to get it back to them as soon as possible. Gotcha. Well, guys, uh, we've done a lot of discussing tonight and gotten a lot of great opinions. And I know we probably haven't covered everything that the AU world entails. But if you guys have a final thought on something you think people should take away from this conversation about AAU, um, please share that. And Travis, we'll, we'll start with you. Um, kind of just looking at this chat. Uh, going back to the earlier question, is there an optimal age to start playing AU? Um, I would just kind of, my advice just in general um, that I would like to close on is like get kids in. If they have a passion for it, play. Um, and if they start playing at a young age, just let them be kids. Just let them play the game. Um, they're not getting evaluated. They're not getting scouted. They're not buying for offers at the age of eight. And they won't be until, like Tom said, until they're about sophomores in high school. Um, so just let them play. Let them enjoy it. Uh, recommend If they have that passion, I recommend doing it just because um, the more game reps, the more live reps you get, the better you're going to be in the long term. Um, so just let them go out there, let them play, and just let them have, enjoy it and have fun. And then um, when it comes down to – high school and, and once it gets to those situations um, trust the coaches and, and find good people around to, to kind of put them in the positions to succeed. That's great advice. Tom, how about yourself? Um, I think that Dave has done a great job of bringing up a, a theme of this, which is the people that are around you, the people that you consult, the people whose team you play on, the people who you call your friends um, in the AAU or travel basketball world. It is uh it's very difficult to tell, especially when you're brand new to it. When you're brand new, anybody can impress you with any small amount of knowledge. And so if you decide that you want to jump into the travel basketball world and take it serious, um, do a, as much research as you possibly can, because it, it, it really is um, a great pathway to play college basketball. It's a fantastic pathway. But if, you're not, if you've not done your research and you're not around great people, um, it can really be a miserable experience at the same time. Um, there's no sense in kids bouncing from three to four or five AAU teams in the same summer. There's no sense. It, it, what that was is a lack of research, the lack of figuring out who you're around. It's a, so it, I would say, um, you know, again, we could talk about so many different topics for hours, but for, the, for tonight, it would be do your research and actually take this serious. Um, if you decide that you want to be a serious basketball player. What I mean by that is research, verify what people are telling you. Um, Google is a great tool. And so anything somebody tells you, verify it. But make sure that you're around the right people um, and, and that you've researched that they're the right people. Yeah, Corey, are you there? Okay. You, can you hear me, Tom? Okay, yeah, we can hear you. Yep. Yeah, yep. Uh, I, I agree 100% with what, what the, both the gentlemen said. Tom and Travis have hit everything. I mean, they've, they've done a great job of expressing the same concerns I would have. And I, I agree with Tom 100%. You have the AAU world can damage a kid as much as it can help them. I mean, it could really ruin a kid if, if they play for the wrong coach, wrong program. Um, you know, you really have to do your homework and you really have to uh, make sure that you do the best by your child. And a lot of times parents are afraid of that coach because he's hard on a kid um, or the coach is pushing that kid and the coach is not content with the a kid getting a, a C average in school or, or doesn't play him because he, he got a technical by cursing out a ref. You know, you want to find a, a coach or a program that's going to make your child better and recruitable and push your child to be the best they can be. And a lot of times parents want to go for the quick, 
the quick hitter and just kind of be like, I want to play for this coach because they won this tournament and they, he's getting me in for free and he's going to buy me shoes. Or you really have to, as a parent, uh, step back and say, is this coach going to make my son better? You know, is, is, is he going to push my child and I'm going to stand back and let him do it. I, Frank Martin coaches at South Carolina, I believe. And he has a great thing on YouTube. If you look it up where he says, if my son or daughter is playing for a coach and he's not doing those things, I'm going to take him off the team. Uh, I want him to play for a coach that's going to do it the right way. Coach my son. If he's not going hard, he needs to be told. Uh, if he's not playing the right way, he needs to be told. So um, I'm not going to, you know, Tom brought up some great points. Just to Travis, I don't need to repeat those, but uh, picking the right AAU program is a life changer. It really is. You know, you can really, it's a lifelong relationship you can have for some with some of these guys. So uh, don't take it, uh, you know, as, as not being a serious thing. It, it's, it's, it's important a decision as you can make as a basketball player at that age. So do your homework, uh, find out where this coach has been and, and try to find a coach that's been there, you know, try to find someone that's played at that level or coached at that level or had players that played for them. that are now at that level. So, you know, they've got experience at that. They're not just some guy who, who does a lot of talking, but has never gotten in there. So um, there's just so many different factors that go into picking the right program that I think that was uh, this, the point of discussion here with this, with this panel. And I think that we did a good job of kind of, you know, going through the weeds a little bit and getting all that figured out. Yeah. Well said. Well, guys, thank you so much for joining Tom, Dave, and Travis. You guys provided a lot of information, both for me and uh, for everybody out there that is trying to learn how to make the right decision. And uh, I think this was an invaluable tool. For everyone out there, I left my uh, website and email. If you want to get in touch with me with any questions, if you want me to connect you with Tom, Dave, or Travis, I can do that as well. And they're also uh, can be found on social media. But thank you all for joining today. Uh, we look to do this again in the future, maybe about parents or another topic. But this is a constantly changing field. Every day, something changes, whether it's NCA rules, um, transfer portal or other things. So you've got to be proactive and you've got to, you know, keep your finger on the pulse if you want to stay ahead of the game. And it's not easy, but, um, you know, get better grades, get better in the court and that, that'll make everything else easier. So um, thank you all very much. We appreciate joining and uh, take care.